Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Today, inshallah, we'll be continuing with the subject matter of the niqab, which is the covering of the face of the believing women, the veil that covers the face of the believing women. Inshallah, we'll be continuing on the subject matter. We'll be going in depth in the subject matter. We're not going to just, you know, take it lightly and just spend 30 minutes, 20 minutes on it, and then that's it. Inshallah, we'll go in depth in it, inshallah. And today, uh, we'll be going over what are the things that we'll be using as our dalil, you know what I'm saying, our adilla or our dalil. And again, the things that we're going to be using for our dalil or our proofs, our points, and our evidence as to what it is that we say or what it is or, or what it is uh, that we believe in, you know, with regards to our application here at Talib Movement, with regards to the cap, uh, we're using chapter 4, verse 59, right? That's the template with regards to obeying Allah, obeying the Prophet, right? So, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, chapter 33, uh, verse 59, Surah Al-Azab, with regards to the, uh, the hijab, and also Surah uh, Nur, chapter 24, verse 30 through 31, also talking about the, the Jalabi. And also, uh, just to know what we're using with regards to our Dalil and the books that we're using, uh, the top seer books that we're getting our evidence from, uh, is the top seer of uh, Tabari, uh, Qurtubi, uh, Ibn Kathir, uh, Bagawi and Sa'adi. These are the five uh, top seer books that I'm using or getting my Dalil from, although there's more uh, top seer books out there, Alhamdulillah Rabbil uh, Alameen, but these are the five that I'm using, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So inshallah, uh, as I said, we're going to do an in-depth uh, study uh, on the subject matter and with regards to these verses. So what we're doing or what I'm doing is going through uh, the verses. Uh, chapter 33 verse 59 and the top seer on this verse we're going to go through every top seer book and see what that top seer book says with regards to that ayat and the same thing with chapter 24 verse 30, 31 we're going through all uh, five top seer books with regards to that ayat and see what it says and what they said so inshallah we'll see uh, that there is a consensus of what is known uh, to be the sunnah or what is wajib uh, for the women to wear for the boys to uh, in the cap. So inshallah beginning uh, We'll begin with chapter 33 verse 59 Okay, chapter 33 Verse 59 will be our first uh, Source of uh, Dalil And this is the verse of the hijab And chapter 33 verse 59 Allah states I will give you love in the shaitan regime O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to draw their cloaks, the Jalabib, their veils over their bodies, to screen themselves completely, except the eyes or one eye to see the way. That is most convenient that they should be known as such and not molested. And Allah is our forgiving, most merciful. So in this ayah, this is the ayah of the hijab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the believing women telling the daughters, telling the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they're supposed to draw their veils, you know, over their bodies. So we're going to go into the top seer with regards to the explanation of the Quran. And again, we're using these books. And the first book that we're going to go through is a Tabari. Inshallah, the Dalil that I'm using is from Tabari. We're going to go through Tabari. Then we're going to go through Qutrabi. Then we're going to go through Ilqatir, Bagawi, and Sa'adi. Inshallah. So again, the first book, Tabari. In this ayat, in chapter 33, verse 59, Tabari states, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his wives to their wives, you know, his daughters and the believing women, and drawing the veils of their body. Right? Tabari said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he says, Say, O Muhammad, right? Say to your wives, your daughters, and the believing women, right, that they are not to resemble the slave women in their clothing when they leave their houses for any type of necessity because they, the slave woman, used to show their hair and their faces. Again, this is from the Tafsir of Tabari. So Tabari says in the Tafsir that when Allah subhanahu wa revealed this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa was telling the wives, he was telling the daughters, and the believing women that they are not to resemble the slave women in their clothing when they go out of their houses for any type of necessity because they, the slave woman, used to show their hair and their faces. Okay, so the last one that reveal these ayahs with the bars to the modesty and making a distinction between the slave woman 
right? And the free woman, okay? So it wasn't just uh, uh, about covering the hair or covering the face, right? It's also about status and modesty and protection, okay? Alhamdulillah, what does that mean? Also in the top city of Tabai, Ali ibn Taha reported that Ibn Abbas bin al said, who said that this ayah, again, so Ibn Abbas bin Al-An, he's giving his tafsir or his explanation of this ayah. And again, Ibn Abbas bin Al-An, he was blessed with the interpretation of the Quran. So none of us can say that our interpretation, our understanding of the ayahs are better than Ibn, uh, uh, better than Ibn Abbas because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for him. So alhamdulillah, Rabbi al -Amin. So Ibn Abbas bin Al-An, he said that this ayah, Right? O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women to draw their cloaks to the Jalabib over their bodies. It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded that when the believing women leave their houses for any necessity, they are commanded to cover and wrap their faces. The wujuhu hinna, wujuhu hinna, starting from above their heads with their Jalabib, their wrap, and to only uncover or show one eye. So again, Ibn Abbas, he said that when this ayah was revealed with the words to old prophet, tell your wives, your daughters, and the believing women to draw their veils over their bodies. Ibn Abbas, he said that Allah was commanding the Prophet Muhammad sallam, to command the believing women that when they leave their houses for any type of necessity, going outside to the backyard, going to the front yard, going to go get the mail, any type of necessity, they are commanded to cover and wrap their faces, starting from above their heads with their jalabi, and to only uncover and show one eye. And this is in the top city of Tabari. And again, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, he was blessed with the dua of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu with interpretation of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Ibn In another narration, again, in Tabari, Ibn Sa'in reported that he asked Ubaida, Right, al, -sal al Salmani. Right, Ibn Sarin, he asked Ubaidah al Salmani about this verse. And he said that he answered him by covering and wrapping his head and his face with a stove and opening his stove for one of his eyes to be seen. So now we're told again by again by some of the Salaf, Ibn Sarin. He said he asked Ubaidah al Salmani. He asked him about this ayah. And what is the interpretation of it? Or what does it mean? Or what was the understanding of the way of the people of that time when this ayah came? So Ubaidah, instead of telling him, he showed him and he put on a thobe, he covered all of his body, he covered his head, he covered his face with a thobe, and then he opened the thobe for one eye. Okay, again, tafsir of Tabari. Again, we're going through Tabari. In another narration by Ibn Sarin, he reported that Ubaidah covered and wrapped his face and his head and opened up his garment for his left eye. Okay? So we have one narration that Ubaidah, he opened it up and it said one eye, and another narration that said a specific eye that he opened up the garment for the left eye. So again, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Ma'an, he said that Allah was commanding the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to command the believing women that when they go out the house for any type of necessity, right, that they cover their head, they cover their faces, right, for any type of necessity, and they allow an eye or the eyes to be seen. This is the interpretation of Ibn Abbas, one of the best interpreters of the Quran, because he was given a dua by the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with regards to his understanding. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Alameen. So again, in another narration, Ibn Sayyid reported that Ubaidah, he covered and wrapped his face and head and opened the garment for the left eye to be seen. So in one narration it says one eye, then it says specific eye. Then another narration it said the left eye. Alhamdulillah, mean. From Ibn Abi Naji, from Mujahid. So Mujahid said that this verse, and draw your cloaks, your jalabi, over your bodies. He said that it means, it, it means that they thus engaged in wearing the jalabi so that it would be known that they were free women and thus not be harmed by a faucet, a transgressor, by words, and so that there is no doubt as to her being free. So Mujahid, who was a student of Ibn Abbas, 
right? And it said that Mujahi said that he sat with Ibn Abbas multiple times going through the whole Quran and the interpretation of the Quran. So Mujahid was one of the best students of Ibn Abbas. So Ibn Abbas, so Mujahid said that this verse means, again, for the guards to tell the women to draw their cloaks over the Jalabib. He said it means that they thus engaged in wearing the Jalabib, meaning the believing women, they thus engaged in wearing the Jalabib so that it would be known that they were free women, right? And thus not be harmed by a faucet or a transgressor by words. And so that there is no doubt as to her being free. So the Jalabi or the covering, right, is a badge of honor to show that you're free, that you're not a slave. Okay? And also, as we're going to get into in another narration, it says that you're not promiscuous. Right? That you're not wanton. Right? That you're not a woman of Jahalibah. Okay? So wearing the, wearing the Jalabi. Wearing the niqab, wearing the veil, covering the body, everything except the face, except except the eyes, right? Covering the face, right? This is so that you won't be harmed, and so that you can be known as a free woman, a dignified woman. Alhamdulillah, mean. Thus, that which is best for the believing women, because Allah spoke to said, "This is best for you." Thus, that which is best for you, meaning for the believing women, it is the jalabi or the niqab. Also, we have a statement of Katada. Katana said, and this is a dicker, and this was in the top seal of Kurdabi, and this information that I'm going to share, it may not be about the niqab, but it has to do with the history of you know what was going around at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, some history or some knowledge with regards to his wives, some of the wives' names, some of his children. So inshallah, as was going through the top seal, some of this information came up, and I thought there would be uh, some information that would be good for us to know as Muslims, you know, in our deen. <laughs> so, Katala said, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa died, he had nine wives. Okay? So when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa died, he said he had nine wives. Okay? Five were from Quraysh. So from the five wives, five of them was from Quraysh. Right? His tribe. Five of them. Those that were from the Quraysh were Aisha, Hafsa, who was the daughter of Umar, Um Habiba, Sauda, and Um Salama. So inshallah, we'll write these, these, these names down. These were the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that came from the Quraysh tribe. Okay, so inshallah, so we can get familiar with some of these names, inshallah. So we already know what? Aisha. Right? It said that Aisha. Who else? Hafsa. Right? And Hafsa, she was the daughter of Umar. Regular Ali. Okay? So, with Hafsa, being the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, right, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that means that Umar was the father-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the son-in-law of Umar ibn al right? So they were intertwined, right? They were relatives, right? Through marriage and, and through tribe, but also through marriage. So Aisha, Hafsa, right? Then we have Um Habiba. Right? And it's good with the women because we're learning about the women that you guys should learn about these women and find out what were some of the good qualities, right, about these women. Right? Then we have uh, Sauda. Right? And number five, Um Salama. Right? And each one of these women had different qualities. Okay, so in knowing some of the names of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
right? We want to know what they said about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They lived with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were intimate with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at times that nobody else could be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They seen him pray at night. They seen certain things. So we should try to find out who these women are, what were some of the characteristics, right? So what were some of the things that they did that made them special, right? That the Prophet Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said certain things about, you know, these women at their promised paradise, or he said that one of the women, their, their, their arm is long, Right? Not meaning that she has long arms, it means that she's she she's giving with Sadaqa. Right? There's a there's a book called Women Around uh, the Prophet, another book called Women of Medina. And it's about all the great women around the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I recommend it for the, the Muslim women or the low strong to be the Mu'min not to see what, what some of the characteristics of these women. Okay? So we said that five of them were from Quraysh, Aisha, Hafsa, Um Habiba, Sauda, and Um Salama. Three of them were from the other neighboring Arab tribes. So they weren't from Quraysh, but they were from other Arab tribes. And these three were Maimuna, Zainab bin Jash, And Juwayria. Ju Wai Ria. Okay? Those are the three from the other neighboring Arab tribes. Okay? It says with the voice of his children, he had both boys and girls. Okay, he had both boys and girls. The boys' names were Awesome. So one of the names of the boys that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, was Awesome. This was one of the names of the sons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Awesome. Right? His mother was Khadija. So Khadija was the mother of Awesome. And from him, Tawson, is where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he takes his kunya. Okay? And kunya is like your nickname. Right? So the kunya, or the nickname of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because his son was named Qasim, the kunya of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Abu Qasim. Abu Qasim. Right? The norm is that Whatever is the name of your firstborn son, right, or your firstborn, right, then you would say, I am the father of, right, whatever that name is, right, me, my name is Abu Amani, Makunya Abu Amani, right, because my firstborn was Amani, I didn't have a son until many years later, right, so my Kunya, right, Abu Amani, or it could be Abu Yusuf, because my first son, name is Yusuf. Right, but Abu Amani is my kunya. Okay, so that's how it works. Again, the boys were Qasim, his mother was Khadija, and from him is where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, takes his kunya, which is Abu Qasim. He was the first to die from the children of the Prophet Muhammad. وسلم. So Qasim was the first person or one of the first children to die of the Prophet Muhammad. وسلم, and he only lived to be two years old. Okay, so that's why we don't hear that much about him. He only lived to be a baby. He was a baby. He was only two years old. Okay, two years old. But just think how much joy he had and whatnot. You know, look at, you know, you have a son, he's two, get ready to be three. Our son, get ready to be three years old. My son, get ready to be three years old. Two years, that's a lot of time, a lot of bonding. You know, a humble love with a lot of me. The mother of his son, Ibrahim. So now we have another son that the Prophet Muhammad said, had. And his name was Ibrahim. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he also had another son, and his name was Ibrahim. The mother of Ibrahim was Maria al Kuptiya. Okay? Ibrahim, his mother name was Maria. 
ماريا رايت القبطية رايت ميني ماريا ذا كابتيك أو ماريا ذا إيجيبشن أو ماريا ذا أفريكان أوكي so the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم he had a son right by and there's a difference of opinion whether she was his wife or whether she was other than his wife right but the opinion is that she was his wife um, that Maria she was she was buried in uh, uh, Baqi which we'll find out later on inshallah but uh, one of the opinions is that she was one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and she bore him a son and his name was Ibrahim and her name was Maria al Qupti. She was from Egypt. She was a Coptic. She was African. She was black. So one of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She was African, and she had a son uh, by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and his name was Ibrahim. Okay. The 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 mother of the son of Ibrahim was Maria al Qupti, an African woman from the land of Egypt. He was born in the eighth, in the month of the Hijrah. Eight years after the Hijrah. He was born in the month of the Hijrah, eight years after the Hijrah. So he was born eight years after the migration. Okay? So he was born in the eighth year of Hijrah, right? During the month of the Hijrah, what we just went through, right? For the month of Hajj. Okay? He was born in the month of the Hijrah, eight years after the Hijrah. And he died at 16 months. Okay? So Ibrahim, he died at 16 months. Okay? 16 months. So Qasim was the first one to die. Qasim, he died at the age of two. And Ibrahim, whose mother was Maria al Qutiya, he died at 16 months. Darakukni, which is another one of the scholars, he said that he died at 18 months. So there's a difference of opinion whether he died at 16 months or 18 months. He was buried at Papi, which is a well-known grave site, right, where even some of the Sahabas are buried. He was buried at Papi, right, Ibrahim, and the Prophet Sallallahu said, now listen to this hadith. This is with regards to Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from Maria al Qubdi, the African woman, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in Hadith Sahih. He said, "Verily, he, meaning Ibrahim, has a wet nurse, and his wet nurse is in Jannah." So when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was burying his son Ibrahim, he made a statement to the Sahabas with the words of Ibrahim, something from the Gaib. He said, Barely Ibrahim, he has a wet nurse. He has someone to breastfeed him, even though he's still young. Because remember, he was only 16 months. In Islam, we have the 24 months to breastfeed him. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that Barely Ibrahim, he has a wet nurse. He has someone that's breastfeeding him, and his wet nurse is in the Jannah. So he gives us some understanding of the guy that Ibrahim, even though he died, that he's still being breastfed in the Jannah by who? Allah Allah. But we see, what we say? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And we say we believe in the way, submit not what tuck not. I hope it does what I Okay? So that was just some information, some knowledge that I want to share with you as we was going through uh, this top seer. Because this is some information that we should know. What were some of the names of the prophets? What were some of the names of the kids and whatnot? Because when we start going into the top seer and we start seeing these names of some of the, the wives of the prophets that they said this or they said this, then we understand what type of weight it has because they lived with the Prophet Muhammad. They got their instructions from the Prophet Muhammad so they should know exactly or they should know better than most people what is the understanding of the Prophet Muhammad.